Good evening. Distinguished guests and online viewers, welcome to the first annual Peter Yazzie Distinguished Lecture in Intellectual Property Law. Maybe I should sit down now. Many of you are repeat guests here, and you well know that we have already had many distinguished lectures in IP, but never before have we had one named in Professor Yazzie's honor. None of you who are here or who are watching need to be told why we would name our lecture series in honor of Professor Yazzie, but I will tell you anyway, because it is my honor and delight to share this with you. This lecture series is named for Professor Yazzie in recognition of his extraordinary contributions to the study of intellectual property law at American University and for his lasting contributions to the elevation of the public interest as a primary concern in this domain of law and policy. As an educator, he has encouraged students to explore and become actively engaged in all facets of copyright law. As an early leader and advocate for copyright law in the public interest, Professor Yazzie has long been at the forefront of intellectual property and copyright law with a particular focus on protecting user interests. Professor Yazzie is an internationally recognized scholar who we are so fortunate to have with us as a colleague. He is the author of a leading casebook on copyright law, his earliest published work was devoted to some of the persistent complications we inherited from the 1909 Act. Later, his scholarly focus shifted to the connections between copyright doctrine and cultural history, especially with regard to the co-evolution of the concept of authorship in legal and literary discourse. In 1994, Professor Yazzie was a member of the Librarian of Congress Advisory Commission on Copyright Restoration and Deposit, Registration and Deposit, and thereafter he helped organize the Digital Futures Coalition, an unprecedented umbrella organization of nonprofits and business groups that intervened effectively in the WIPO debate on a new set of copyright treaties and played a role in making the 1998 DMCA less bad than it otherwise would have been. <laughs> More recently, he has been working on the fair use doctrine, promoting its, an understanding of fair use by documentary filmmakers, educators, librarians, and others. He is also concerned about the intersection between copyright and the experience of disability and has long been a consultant to the National Federation of the Blind and has served as part of its legal team in the Authors Guild versus Happy Trust litigation. In 2006-2007, he led an interdisciplinary research team to Indonesia to investigate the connections and conflicts between IP and the traditional arts there, the results of which he published in a book. Professor Yazi is, the trustee of the, is a trustee of the Copyright Society of the United States of America and a member of its edit, editorial board of its journal. In 2007, he received the American Library Association's L. Ray Patterson Copyright Award, and in 2009, the intellectual property section of the D.C. Bar honored him as a champion of intellectual property. And in 2011, he was honored with Public Knowledge's IP3 Award. <laughs> Having taught here for 36 years now, Professor Yazzie is the founder of All Things IP here, and for a good chunk of that time, he was All Things IP here. <laughs> Professor Yazzie founded the two most important and lasting intellectual property institutions at American, the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic and the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property Law. And now I would like to invite Professor Yazzie's current and previous students who are with us tonight to stand up and be recognized as a small demonstration of his influence. And I think um, probably if we use the term student of Professor Yazi, we would all stand up. 
Peter, I'm sure that I speak for so many when I say thank you. You have been a force in my life and an inspiration, and I thank you for all you have done. That, that was, that was e extremely touching. Uh, Christine has a very, very important place in this story as well, because if I was the, the first person doing IP more or less full-time here, Christine was the second. And between us, we have managed to make something much greater than either of us could ever have anticipated. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you all, but it, it turns out that this is, is not actually the first academic lecture series named after a member of my family. Um, <laughs> last spring, actually, I, I was in Oberlin um, to attend a session of the, the long-running Oscar Yassi lecture series on Central European history and politics. But I nevertheless feel that, that perhaps for the first time in my life, I may actually have done something by, by gaining, I'm not going to say earning, but gaining this honor that actually has slightly at least outdone my very accomplished grandfather. For one thing, his lecture series is only biannual. <laughs> <laughs> and for another, his wasn't actually launched until after his death in 1957. <laughs> so I feel especially fortunate on both counts. I have let my children know, however, not to get their own hopes up because the, the fragmentary evidence so far would suggest that this stuff skips a generation. <laughs> no words really can, can fully express my appreciation uh, for this, this signal honor. But I do need to say one thing, however inadequate. None of the stuff that Christine talked about at such embarrassing length would have been possible were it not for the support I've received at every turn for the last, and actually I count slightly different, it's very close to 40 years, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> from the WCL community. The my colleagues, the administration, the wonderful staff at WCL have aided and abetted all of my more sensible projects, and they've just as importantly tolerated my more fanciful ones. So I'm just, I'm intensely grateful to this place and to all it has represented and meant to me in my life, both professional and personal. And I'm especially proud of this tremendous intellectual property team that we've assembled together over the last 20 years. Um, an extraordinary faculty, an extraordinary staff. We really have come to a point in this school with respect to this program that I, I could never have envisioned. So we, Christine is with us. and and. And, and Mike and Jonas and George and Sean and Meredith and Mike Palmetto at Pidgeop and whoever it is that I'm leaving out of this list. It's literally gotten too long and too numerous a group to count, and that's just, just the way I like it. So this is quite an accomplishment, not only for me, but really, I think, in particular for the school. So I hope and expect that this is going to be the first of many lectures to come. I'm looking forward to them all. And I'm particularly delighted to have as our inaugural speaker in the, the rebooted lecture series, uh, Professor Christopher Sprigman of the University of Virginia Law School, where he is the class of 1983 research professor, which means that at least in one sense, his position is even more venerable than my own. In every other sense, though, apart from that, Chris is the very epitome of the modern intellectual property scholar. You know, in my day, both as a working lawyer and then as a, well, as a student and then as a working lawyer and then as a teacher, we were brought up to think of copyright law as a, 
as a sort of detached disciplinary island. Pleasant, but remote, <laughs> with few bridges to the mainland of legal discourse, and supported, as it were, by a substructure of what were, in fact, dubious and largely unexamined assumptions. Chris, like the other young scholars of whom he is such a fine representative, have changed all that. Where we once luxuriated in intellectual isolation, he celebrates connections that link IP to competition law, in which he has a special and very valuable expertise, to legal theory, and perhaps most important of all, to the systematic study of the innovation process. It's that last perspective in turn that has permitted Chris to challenge so many of the previously unexamined orthodoxies of the field, including the persistent claim that intellectual property protection provides an essential and universal source of encouragement to new creativity. And I think we'll hear a little bit more about that this evening. A uh, graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, Chris Clerk for Judge Reinhardt in the Ninth Circuit, and then for the Constitutional Court in South Africa. And after stints at the Justice Department and in private practice, he joined the faculty at Virginia in 2005. In a few short years since then, and in, in the life of an academic, it really is just a few short years, his fresh approach has enabled Chris to lay down a body of work that is as coherent as it is substantial, again and again, whether he's taking seriously the, the then taboo topic of reformalizing copyright or seeking empirical clues to the question of what IP protection actually is worth or opening our eyes to the many worlds of creative practice that seem to function just fine, thank you, with little or no support from the formal intellectual property system, Chris always reminds us that fresh ways of looking at familiar problems often yield unexpectedly useful results, including an enhanced appreciation for the role that imitation plays in the process of cultural production. So we celebrate tonight um, Chris Brigman for his, his elegant iconoclasm and his fearless commitment to scholarly inquiry wherever it may lead. His accomplishments to date are also due in no small part to the grace with which he expresses his findings. And, and tonight we're privileged to have him present some findings from his engrossing new book written with Cal Rostalia, The Knockoff Economy. Chris? Thank you, Peter. That's, that's very kind. It's a great pleasure for me to come talk to you about my book, but it's a greater pleasure uh, for me to um, come and pay my um, deepest respects to Peter, who is um, a force in this field and has been very influential to me. So I want to I talk a little bit about that first. Um, my first encounter with Peter was through his work in the early mid and mid-90s on the nature of authorship. So by the time I got to this, <clears throat> um, it was the late 90s, and I was a lawyer at the Department of Justice in the Antitrust Division. I was uh, working on the Microsoft case and some other cases, but I was deeply interested in copyright and trying as hard as I could to educate myself. And one of my early forays was into Peter's article uh, in the Duke Law Journal on the metamorphoses of, of authorship. In it, Peter makes the observation, which seems completely obvious now, but like a lot of good ideas, was not terribly obvious at the time, that... Um, the concept of authorship, which is so central in copyright law, wasn't simply an off-the-shelf bit that was plugged into the early law, but was a complicated set of ideas, contested and fluid, that was shaped over time in search of some interests. Um, so here's Peter from the Duke article. Let me just give you a taste of this. Legal scholars, Peter says, concerned with copyright, occupy themselves not by analyzing copyright theory, but instead by debating the rights and wrongs of technical doctrinal issues presented by judicial opinions. Legal scholars' failure to theorize copyright relates to their tendency to mythologize authorship, leading them to fail or refuse to recognize the foundational concept for what it is, a culturally, politically, economically, and socially constructed category, rather than a real or a natural one. 
Now, Peter introduced me to the critical analysis of the concept of authorship, and actually I should be clear, he introduced me to thinking about the concept at all. I, I had been captured by the romantic notion. I had totally imbibed it. And Peter, along with Martha Woodmansey and some others, shook me awake. Um, he showed me how arguments that were pitched at uh, protecting authorship often were cloaks for a, a meaner, narrower um, agenda. And under Peter's tutelage, I learned to see authorship for what it is, actually, a diverse thing, a social phenomenon, a human urge, um, a fugitive sort of property. Um, some authors work in ways that are closer to the romantic ideal, but in my mind, they never actually touch it. All authorship happens in social context, and it's deeply embedded in communities of creators. It's a social practice as much or more as it is an individual act. Um, There's one other thing I learned from Peter, both from reading his work and just from interacting with him over the years that I, I want to share, which I think is important. Um, if you talk to him and you read his work, you'll know that Peter really knows the copyright law. He knows it inside out. Um, and he was influential in, in showing me and others what's really at stake when we talk about copyright policy. So Peter thinks this is an island and it's pleasant but remote. Um, I never got that sense. I got the sense that it was an important island and um, worth visiting. Um, Peter understands the system's deep logic and its praiseworthy aspirations. And at its best, I, I think what he showed me was that copyright law is an attempt to call forth the sort of innovation that makes our culture, that educates our kids, that improves our lives. I can't deny that current copyright law is in some parts not exactly what I'd want. We never should have removed formalities from the law. We should not have statutory damages structured in the way we do that makes potential liability so difficult to uh, assess. And there are some excesses that I think people are aware of. The copyright term, for example, is indefensibly long. I hope that if anyone ever has the gall to put up another copyright extension bill in front of Congress, we'll put a stop to it. But at its core, I believe in this system. It has been, and I believe it remains, largely a force for good. Um, that is, uh, nonetheless, I must admit that copyright's in a lot of trouble these days in academia and increasingly in the mind of the public. Copyright needs defenders. Um, Peter's been one of those. He points out some of its infirmities, but also some of its qualities. And I, I'd like to, to follow in his footsteps in that. Um, so this brings me to my talk. Um, and I want to start with one of the deepest suppositions of copyright law, uh, the theory that animates it. So what's, what's the theory? Um, so the theory is that we need property rights because innovation is often expensive to accomplish, but easy to copy, right? That's the theory. And so because of this um, fact, we need property rights to prevent copyists who don't face the same cost of innovation as the innovators do from siphoning off all the gains from innovation. And if they succeed in doing so, we fear a market failure, right? We fear a systemic disincentive to engage in innovative uh, activity in the first place. This is a completely coherent theory. Um, but I want to show you something that um, at the time um, interested me and has worked out in a way that leads you to think, well, what's going on with the theory? So here are two pictures. Um, you'll probably recognize them. Um, on one side, we have a page from Encarta. This was the Microsoft Encyclopedia. And on the right, we have a page from Wikipedia. It's the entry from Wikipedia about Encarta. Now, probably you know what happened, right? So back in 1995, Microsoft's flush with cash. They decide, I think very honorably, to take a bunch of this cash and invest it in a knowledge tool. They want to bring an encyclopedia to people. They're going to support it with ads, but it's basically going to be mostly free to access. They put millions and millions of dollars into this. They hire a whole bunch of programmers, but also um, encyclopedia specialists and subject area specialists, and they go at it, right? So this is a, the gold standard of a successful company. They've, they've decided they really want to do this, um, and they put some effort into doing it. At about the same time, a group of people who seem kind of flaky and even vaguely communist um, got together <laughs> and decided that they would start an encyclopedia. And, you know, I, I cottoned onto this pretty early, and I thought, well, this is interesting. Uh, we'll see how it turns out. So they decided they would structure it this way. They would rely on volunteers. They would essentially give the people who volunteered the ability to shape this um, 
publication with virtually um, no control on them other than their own norms, right? Editing each other's work for quality, accuracy, fairness, etc. cetera. Um, they um, licensed this work under a license that permitted people to copy this material as long as credit was given for its source. So no copyright protection for this material, no real large-scale investment, and you know, you know what happened next, right? And Carta was shuttered a few years ago, and it lives on mostly as an entry in Wikipedia, which, <laughs> as of this point, is for people, I think, under the age of 30, um, pretty much the only reference source that they know anything about. Um, we have a footnote in the book where we wrote on Wikipedia, and we largely wrote on Wikipedia by citing Wikipedia, but then we assured people that we fact-checked it. Okay, so what does this all mean? Um, well, let's get back to the theory. So we have a theory that copyright is necessary to motivate investment in creative effort. Here we have actually what it turns out to be when you aggregate it, pretty enormous investment in creative effort, not motivated by copyright. There's nothing wrong with the theory, but the theory is incomplete. Um, and the first time that Cal and I, Cal Rossiel and my co-author, noticed this um, was when we started thinking about the fashion industry. Okay, so $200 billion worth of commerce in the States. Highly creative industry. One and a half, maybe trillion dollars of commerce around the world. Actually hard to measure precisely. In the United States, fashion design not covered by copyright. Why is it not covered by copyright? A lot of copyright mavens in the audience, and you'll know that fashion is a useful article. Right? It keeps us warm, it keeps us out of jail, um, and so uh, its utility screens it out of copyright protection. So there's, there's some limited copyright protection for fashion. Fashion um, um, fabric designs are copyrightable, and um, some uh, elements of a fashion design, so say an epaulette that's kind of bolted on to a jacket, can be copyrightable because it's actually physically removable. But for the most part, the shape, the cut right, of a garment, not copyrightable. And in fact, in the fashion industry, at least in the States, because copyright doesn't apply, you get lots and lots of copying. If you think of the term knockoff, right, it comes from the fashion industry, and you see this every day, right? We, we see the Oscars, the actresses go out on the red carpet, there's a dynamite dress out there on the red carpet, and within a couple of days, there are houses all over the country in New York, LA, and elsewhere that will have copies of this designer gown out on the street at vastly reduced price within days, okay? So we see this all the time. And we don't just see copying point, point for point, we see the fashion industry spinning out derivative works. So we see designs being mimicked, even if not copied point for point, in a large number of derivative works every season in pretty much every niche of the fashion industry. Now, how does the fashion industry innovate in an environment where copying isn't only um, commonplace, it's the norm. So Cal and I started thinking about this, and we came up with what we think are two uh, central features of the fashion industry that explain why in the fashion industry imitation is not hostile to innovation. In fact, imitation is at the heart of innovation. So the first is, a, is an observation about obsolescence, and this is really about trends. So here are some shoes, and this kind of got the project started. So I'd just been hired as a law professor. It was 2005. It was the summer. And I had lots of lawyer clothes, but I had no law professor clothes. So I went to Nordstrom, and I went shopping. Um, there was a table in Nordstrom, and it had a bunch of shoes around. Um, there was a round table, and there were shoes arranged uh, around the table. And they all looked like these shoes. These are driving shoes. Um, the original driving shoe by Diego de Valle, a very high-end designer who worked for the Todd firm. Um, he, the story goes, was eating lunch with Enzo Ferrari, that Ferrari, and <laughs> Enzo Ferrari was complaining to him that um, his moccasins, his very expensive leather moccasins, were being chewed up because he'd be driving his Ferrari around Italy from girlfriend's apartment to girlfriend's apartment, and that <laughs> the, the backs of his shoes would get the leather rubbed off on the very rough floor mats of the Ferrari. So Diego de Valle said, I think I can solve that, and he took a moccasin that Enzo Ferrari liked, and he applied to it a what he called a gomino sole, which is a, a sole made of rubber pebbles, and he ran it up the back of the shoe. So this became the driving shoe. 
right? A kind of casual shoe um, made for Enzo Ferrari. And this had a, a heyday um, in kind of one percenter areas of the United States and Europe, briefly in the late 70s, early 80s, and then it disappeared. And then it reappeared in about a dozen and a half different versions on a table in Nordstrom in Paramus, New Jersey in 2005. <laughs> so I'm standing there looking at this table thinking, what's going on, right? Why is this happening? Cal and I have been talking about the fashion industry for a few months at this point, and it kind of clicked. It all kind of clicked in the weeks following. The first idea is, well, so there's a Diego de Avaya original, and then there are lots of copies. Now, these shoes aren't exactly the same, but they're all visibly based on the Diego de Avaya original. So um, there's the one I bought. That's Echo, the one on the top. That's a kind of cheap version for law professors. The green ones are for Ralph Lauren. I'm not sure who those are for, but they exist. Um, anything that exists, Ralph Lauren apparently will make a green version of it that season. So in any event, um, all these copies, what do they do? Together they set a trend, right? They set a trend. And the trend for a guy like me who really just wanted to buy shoes, um, this trend was a signal to me that these shoes were desirable, that this design was popular. This signal that gets sent to me is created by copying. Copying helps create trends. Trends sell fashion. So Shakespeare observed this a long time ago where he said the, uh, the, the fashion wears out more apparel than the man. Right? We don't get rid of clothes by and large, at least in affluent societies, because they're falling apart. We get rid of them because the style has shifted. So what does the fashion industry want to do? They want to shift the style. And the style shifts when a design catches on enough that it becomes widely copied. The style is then created. People buy into the trend to stay in style. And then the nice thing about copying is once it's set up the trend, if the copying continues and the trend gets copied more and more and more, it then gets overdone. And the fashionistas who don't like to look like everybody else jump off. Jump off onto what? Onto the new trend that copying is helping to set. So the fashion cycle is old news. We've known about this for a long time. What, what's interesting is in this industry, it's copying that fuels it. Copying creates trends. Copying kills them. Trends set fashion. Without copying, the trend cycle would slow down. The fashion industry would be smaller. It would be poorer. It would be less innovative. But this isn't to say that individual designers, when they're copied, aren't aggrieved. They are. But on the whole, and over time, across an absolutely gigantic industry that dwarves the music industry or the motion picture industry or the commercial publishing industry, copying works out in terms of a bigger, more vibrant industry. So that's, that's one story to tell about copying. So there's another. And again, I'm going to use shoes as an example. Um, the shoe at the bottom is a, a one you probably recognize, and you probably recognize it because it's trademarked in such an interesting way. This is a this is a Christian Louboutin platform pump. And you see the trademark, right, the red outsole. Now, you can't copy the trademark, as um, Yves Saint Laurent is learning to his dismay. Um, but you can copy the design of the shoe. And the design of the platform pump a few years ago widely copied. There was a, this boomlet in platform pumps. And you can see all these versions from all these different manufacturers. Some look very much like the Louboutin platform pump. Some look different, so there's a kind of a Mary Jane version with a strap. There's a peak toe version, right? There's all these different versions of the shoe. Now, copying, I think, serves a function here, too, and that is um, a woman gets up in the morning and she faces an information problem. What do I wear, right? Copying helps to, s to send information about, in a sense, the social acceptability of a design. A design is going to become part of a trend. It's going to become widely worn by women in your social class, in your you know, social group. And so you face less uncertainty in wearing it. It lowers the risk of getting dressed. So you can think about this in kind of standard law and economics terms. Um, the market clears at a higher level of output because people face fewer transaction costs in deciding what to put on their body. Copying helps to resolve these information problems that the fashion industry faces every season and for its customers every morning when they go to the closet. Again, copying serves a useful signaling function that makes it friendly to innovation in the fashion industry. Industry is bigger, more robust, more innovative than it would be without copying. Okay, so that's fashion. And Cal and I spent a long time in 2005, 2006 writing a paper on this, and, you know, we got very lucky. Uh, the minute we 
published this paper, um, introduced into Congress was a bill to extend copyright to the fashion industry. This was kind of tailor-made for us. Um, we spun out, you know, our explanation of why we thought this was a bad idea. So far, it hasn't happened. Um, but, you know, uh, the story doesn't, I hope, end there. Um, bigger even than fashion, and also similarly an industry that innovates without a whole lot of IP protection is food. Now, notice I say not a whole lot of IP protection. It's not like there's no IP for food. There's patents for certain types of food, and there's certainly plenty of trademark in food, just like there is in the fashion industry. But recipes are not, for the poll, on the whole, copyrightable. Right? If, if copyright applies to recipes, it does so in a very thin way. So let me take you back a few thousand years to the Greek city-state of Sybaris, uh, and there's the first intellectual property system that we have any evidence for. Um, it's described um, in a book called The Dinopsophists, um, which is a, a kind of uh, ancient Greek um, uh, Kitty Kelly type book. It's, it's mostly a tell-all about how people misbehave to parties, but there's also a great passage in it about the Sybarites who um, the writer of the Dinopsophists was saying were, you know, luxury lovers. And they were such luxury lovers that they craved new cuisine. So they set up a system where if you had a great new recipe, you would bring it to a jury. And if they liked it, they would give you a one-year exclusive right within the city walls of Sybaris to prepare the recipe. So that sounds completely modern, right? That's an intellectual property system for recipes. But since the Sybarites... Intellectual property systems like that have been few and far between. For the most part, recipes are outside the scope of copyright. You can readily see why. They're mostly just a list of ingredients, right? Facts about what you need to prepare that souffle. These are not copyrightable. And then there are processes that are involved, baking, frying, stirring, mixing, right? All these things, these processes ruled outside the scope of copyright by the idea expression distinction. Now, of course, these processes could be patentable, and I'm sure Nathan Miravold is busy as we speak patenting cooking processes, but most cooking processes are very old, right? Um, people have been messing with them, and I have been screwing them up for a long time, right? So they're not within the scope of patent either. All right, so lots and lots of copying is possible in the world of recipes, and let me just give you a great example. This is one of my favorites, the molten chocolate cake. So people assign this to Jean-Georges von Gerichten. Let's admit right now we're not sure he's really the innovator, but he's certainly the popularizer. Um, he serves it in his fine restaurants at a very high price, and Chili's serves a version in theirs at a much lower price. And in fact, if you look on the internet, you can find the recipe for the Chili's version of the molten chocolate cake. Right? So this recipe is freely reproducible, and yet there's lots of investment and lots of production of new recipes. Right? So why? We, we've seen a story in the fashion industry about how imitation is not hostile to innovation. What's the story in cuisine? Well, there are a few explanations. So there's some really good research by Eric von Hippel and Emmanuel Flachar who look at French chefs, and they notice that French chefs have an IP norms system that doesn't prohibit copying, but that does demand that when one elite chef copies another, that attribution be given. Right? And when attribution isn't given, there's a system of informal punishments, mostly refusal to share information, often about the availability of really good ingredients with the offending chef. Right? So a norms-based intellectual property system, this isn't law, it's just social practice, but according to von Hippel and Fauchard, this is an effective break, at least for this group of chefs who are in competition with one another on copying. Not, not, a, not a complete bar to copying, but... A, a channeling of it, a channeling of it that leads to a related concern of chefs, and that's reputation. So it's very difficult to run a merely excellent restaurant, but it's even more difficult to get a reputation for true innovation. And the difference between running a merely excellent restaurant and an innovative one can be huge in terms of returns to the chef. So what the chef really seems to care about, at least in Fashar and von Hippel's account, is having that reputation for innovation be respected, right? Having attribution given when a dish is copied. So if reputation is respected, that reputation for in innovation and invention um, is something that they can exploit. Now, this is incomplete propertization, right? This is a small little bit of propertization, but it's, it's, it's important, right? It's, it's a micro-propertization of an important element of the story which helps chefs. In addition to that, 
if you think about the business of restaurants, there's a, there's a, there's a product, right? That is the, the recipe or the built food on the plate. But the product is embedded in an experience. It's embedded in a performance, right? So you go to the restaurant and you pay a lot of money, not just for the food, but for the service and the ambiance and the entire experience of the crowd, right? And the excitement of the restaurant. The recipe may be relatively easy to copy. The performance is often incredibly difficult to copy. In terms of the quality of the preparation of the food, the surroundings, the quality of the service, the entire package that the restaurant is. And this is a lesson, I think, that the culinary industry can offer, for example, to the movie industry. So why is it that box office revenues are as resilient as they are in a very bad economy? In part because if the theater experience is great, it's hard to replicate. So I think of the Arclight Theater in LA, for example, a wonderful theater, great sight lines, great seats, great concession stand, you know, kind of a cool crowd, really pleasant surroundings to see a movie, wonderful screen, really good sound. Um, that is hard to replicate, even if you can pirate the movie. You can't pirate the Arclight experience. It's romantic, it's fun, it's expensive, and it's packed. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about a creative industry that, for some of you, will be closer to home, and that's the music industry. Um, the music industry is, of course, very reliant traditionally on copyright. Um, but even within this copyright reliant industry, there's a story to tell about innovation without or actually with less IP. And to do that, I'm going to play you a couple of songs. So um, you'll probably be familiar with both of these. I'll play you snippets of both. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Cream-colored ponies and crisp apple strudels, doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodles, wild geese that fly with the moon on their wings. These are a few of my favorite things. Girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes, snowflakes that stay on my nose and eyelashes, silver white winters that melt into springs. These are a few of my favorite things. Okay, so Rogers and Hammerstein class. Now, let me give you another interpretation of this song, one you're probably familiar with as well. So John Coltrane's interpretation of the same song. Now, this is a story that's probably pretty familiar to a lot of you, but it's worth pausing on just to take stock of it, because I think it's an important example, even within the music history, of what I'm talking about. So John Coltrane gets to cover that musical composition, right? Because there's a special rule in music copyright that allows him to do this. And where does the rule come from? Well, it's a historical accident. So the player piano, right, the first widely distributed, just about the same time as the photograph, but phonograph, but widely distributed means of mechanically reproducing music, um, hits the scene, and uh, the Supreme Court rules that these piano player roles that encode musical compositions aren't in fact copying them, in a sense because people can't read them, right, which um, that decision doesn't last very long, Congress overturns it, and extends copyright to these mechanical reproductions of music, but it has some hesitancy, right? This is a familiar story to a lot of you, but the hesitancy comes from the fact that Aeolian, a company that is pretty powerful in the player piano space, right? The, I guess the operating system market of the time. <laughs> Aeolian is buying up a lot of musical compositions, and the idea is they're going to construct, uh, um, it's hard to imagine them actually succeeding at this, but this is the fear anyway. They're going to construct a kind of vertical going to own the inputs to the player piano. So if you want to play the songs that you love, um, you're going to have to buy the Aeolian machine to play them. So Congress, wary of this, um, extends copyright to these mechanical reproductions of musical compositions, but says 
um, once the composition is, in fact, released to the public, um, anyone who wants to make a mechanical reproduction can do so. There are some procedures, and you have to pay some money to the copyright holder. But this, of course, creates, in copyright, a liability rule. The liability rule has a set price, right, two cents per copy. This price lasts for a long time, and then it's adjusted relatively recently. But if you look at the value of what's paid to composers and you adjust it for inflation, it's lost about 85% of its value since it was set at the pretty low level it was set originally by Congress. So you get some compensation to songwriters, and in fact, often the compensation that's given is below the statutory rate. It's privately negotiated, as most of you know. Right, so you get relatively low levels of compensation. You don't get a property rule. And yet you get tons and tons and tons of innovation in songwriting. And you get lots of innovation in musicianship generally. I mean, think about John Coltrane for a second. Where does his genius you know, lie? Well, you could say he's just tweaking the Rodgers and Hammerstein composition. Right? He's just playing with it. But at some point, you know, in that 13 minutes, you listen to the whole thing, he crosses a frontier. Right? He's not tweaking this composition. He's pioneering something new. Right? He's bringing something truly great to us through somebody else's work. And his ability to do that, in a sense, has been actuated by some fear that Congress had of the Aeolian monopoly that looks kind of ridiculous in retrospect. It was an accident, but it gave us something, I think, enormously valuable. I don't see any evidence that this suppressed the American urge to write songs, I do see a lot of evidence that it helped to free up, to actuate an American culture, especially within jazz, but not just within jazz, of constantly reinterpreting, pushing the meaning of other people's work, relentlessly tweaking it, improving it, opening up new perspectives on it that make music so rich and so compelling. Um, okay. so. Cal and I had wrote, written a fashion paper, and then I, I worked with a, a colleague, Dotan Oliar, um, on stand-up comedians. Now, another creative community that produces a lot of work, um, but copyright virtually irrelevant to them. Why? Well, for practical reasons. It's just too expensive to bring federal litigation when someone steals a joke. Um, but even aside from the practical reasons, there are good doctrinal reasons why copyright's a very difficult road to hoe for comedians. The idea expression distinction, for example, may protect the particular way you phrase a joke, but it makes the underlying comedic idea essentially fair game. Right? So copyright of limited utility to comedians. That said, comedians uh, are not content let joke stealing happen. So I want to show you a couple of videos of comedians, and then I want to talk about um, what it is they're doing um, and how their own behavior um, affects what they produce. So um, first, a clip from Henny Youngman. Gentlemen, Henny Youngman. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here, folks. I had a thing happen to me at the airport. I had three pieces of luggage. I said, I want this piece of luggage to go to Cleveland. I want this piece to go to Toronto. And I want this piece of luggage to go to Miami. He says, we can't do that as you did it last week. <laughs> <laughs> the food on the plane was fit for a king. Here, king. Here, king. <laughs> Any Italians here tonight? I love the Italian people. During World War II, an Italian girl saved my life. She hid me in her cellar. It was in Cleveland. <laughs> a lot of poor people around. A fellow walks up to me and says, I haven't eaten in two days. I said, you should force yourself. <laughs> okay, so Henny Youngman, right? He's the last of the vaudeville MCs, right? When he's a very young man, he starts out as a vaudeville MC. Uh, the Depression comes, the movie industry grows, vaudeville falls apart. He and the younger vaudeville MCs kind of resituate themselves as stand up comedians, right? They take the MCs act and they isolate it, essentially, as, as the only thing in the show. And they start really what we would think of as the modern era of stand up comedy. And we refer to these comedians as kind of post vaudeville genre. What is Henny Youngman doing? He's telling jokes, right? So he's got a whole bunch of jokes. 
Um, they're often not very much related to one another, subject matter-wise. He's, he's clocking through them very quickly. Joke, punchline, joke, punchline. And this is not the way all comedians of that era work, but it's very characteristic of the way most of them did. So I had two of the greatest days of my career in the Smithsonian here in D.C., looking through Phyllis Diller's joke file, which is, which is there. Are, are we recording this, by the way? Yes. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> Too bad. She has, a, she has about 50,000 jokes in that joke file, um, uh, cross-referenced by subject. Um, some of these jokes she wrote, some of these jokes she bought, some of these jokes she stole. Um, the, the ones that are stolen, for example, come from the Lockhorns comic strip that she cut out of the paper obsessively every day and adapted into jokes about her horrible marriage with her fictional husband, Fang. Um, there's a great joke in there about the Supreme Court, which you can read in the book, but it's way too dirty to tell from the uh, but in any event, these are one-liner comedians. Okay. And if you think about the milieu in which they worked, their intellectual property environment, there was no law, essentially, that they could call on. And there was basically no norms about stealing. So they worked in what they referred to as the corn exchange. Right? So Milton Berle would say, uh, when he got up on stage, the guy who came before me was so funny, I dropped my pad and pencil. Right? They, they stole from one another vigorously. Um, and in this environment, right, there's a relatively low amount of investment in the creation of new material. There's, there's new material being created, but it's, it's being kind of passed around, right? Um, you get a lot of comedy. It tends to look like what you see. Let me show you another comedian who's operating in a very different environment. Um, I'm telling you right now, if, if you're easily offended, run. <laughs> Here we go. I'm not a, I'm not a like a hoity-toity kind of girl. I like, I don't wear any jewelry. I'm not like, um, I don't really, I'm not into jewelry or anything. I'm such a hypocrite. I, there's a jewel that I think is, ugh, I'm going to sound like such a Jap. There is one jewel that I think is stunning that I, it's just like a classic and it's just, and by Jap I mean Japanese. <laughs> but it's, um, it's just gorgeous, you know, and it's really, um, it's rare you know, it's only found like on the tip of the tailbone of Ethiopian babies. They I, they debone the babies. I know that sounds so bad when you say it out loud, but no, if you saw it, so worth it. So worth it. You know, it's like how do I even describe it? Like. Uh, like if a um, like if a diamond had that newborn baby smell, like, I want it. <laughs> but I um, have a moral issue with it, obviously, because they're treating the unions um, that debone the babies really bad. <laughs> Pick your battles, I guess. <laughs> so cute. Okay, the inimitable Sarah Silverman. Um, so she's operating in a very different IP environment, right? So the law still doesn't, still doesn't help comedians at all. But um, if you look at the paper that Dotan and I wrote and the, the chapter that Cal and I have in the book that's based on the paper and some other research, um, comedians have, sometime in the late 1960s, um, engineered for themselves a system of intellectual property norms, right? So they have norms against joke stealing that they enforce on one another. And it turns out the environment that comedians operate in is pretty ideally suited for this. So they're together in comedy clubs all the time, and they travel in packs. They watch each other's acts. They become very familiar with each other's acts, and they know a lot about the provenance of particular jokes, bits, etc. And if they see a comedian straying too close to somebody else's material, they can them. And they look to get a settlement, essentially, like most lawyers do, at least when they start litigation. They look to get a settlement. They look to get some kind of agreement to kind of back off that joke that they think is the property of somebody else. If that doesn't work, sometimes these disputes will move to sanctions. And these sanctions are not legal, they're informal, but they're extremely effective, um, comedians told us. So what are these sanctions? So the simple one is bad enough. Robin Williams, who has a reputation for stealing jokes, says, I won't go into comedy clubs because every time I go in there, people badmouth me, they say nasty things to me, they look at me. Right? Now, that may not seem like a lot, but you know, comedians are very good at badmouthing. That's partly why they do what they do for a living. And <laughs> it's unpleasant to go to work every day and have people essentially treating you badly. So 
Bad mouthing often works. It often disciplines joke stealers. If, if that doesn't work, they proceed to the next level, which is um, often group boycotts. Right? So what they do is they get together and they tell um, booking agents of comic clubs, I'm not going to appear on this bill if comedian X is appearing on the bill. So it's a group boycott. And it can be quite effective if the comedian who they're targeting it at is not super famous, right? If the comedian who's the target is super famous, um, it's difficult to discipline them that, that way. And that's, that's true generally of the norm system. Um, great fame is somewhat of an escape from it. But it's not necessarily an escape from the last sanction, which is to punch the offender in the mouth. <laughs> um, so Carlos Mencia, who is reputed as a serial lifter of other people's materials, um, has been confronted. Uh, uh, there's another comedian who told the story on the Howard Stern show about punching his witnesses. Um, and also, Carlos Mencia has been the victim of a simulated beating on South Park. Um, long story. Uh, but in any event, so these are the sanctions. And the idea that comedians have, and they'll tell you is these sanctions don't always work. They work well enough. The copyright law doesn't always work either, right? So what these sanctions do is they maintain enough of, an, of a disincentive to lift from rivals that investment in new material is possible, that significant investment incentives are sustained. So what does this mean? Well, I think the takeaway from this is actually kind of complicated in the following sense. We had lots of comedy back in Henry Youngman's day. Lots. No IP law, no IP norms. Comedians living in the corn exchange, buying, selling, stealing. We have lots of comedy now. In an era where com copyright law still doesn't do much, but copyright norms do quite a bit. What we have, I think, is different comedy now. Right? If you look at what Sarah Silverman's doing, her comedy is not so much telling jokes. And again, she's not inevitable, but she's illustrative of what a lot of modern comedians are like. Her comedy is not so much telling jokes, it's spinning out a narrative. A narrative that arises from and also reinforces a character, a persona that she plays on stage. You can think about this in terms of she has a trademark, right? The trademark is her personality. And her material is imbued with her trademark. And in a world that she lives in now where comedians police each other, it's easier to detect if Sarah Silverman's jokes are being stolen than if Henny Youngman's jokes are being stolen. Because Sarah Silverman's jokes come stamped with her mark. Right? So we have material co-evolving with the evolution of this norm system. I don't know which way the causal arrow runs, but they reinforce one another. The material changes in a certain way, probably for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is it's easier to protect under the norm system. And this is something that comedians told us. I know that the more distinctive I am, the more original. Now, you know, my first reaction to that was, oh, that's great, right? More originality. My second reaction, I think, is a little bit more mixed, and it's the reaction I've stayed with, which is, um, well, there's things to be said about both sorts of creativity. If you're looking for originality in your comedy, right? Sarah Silverman is your game. Um, the kind of comedy that coexists with the norm system is the kind of comedy you probably like. On the other hand, who tells a Sarah Silverman joke to their mother? Right? <laughs> Who tells a Sarah Silverman joke at a cocktail party? The kind of comedy that we had in the, Mil in the Milton Berle, Henny Youngman, Phyllis Diller era, inclusive, communal, right? not one to many, but um, shared by all, this had a lot of social value. And I think the takeaway from the comedy study is innovation can coexist with imitation. It's just that you get a different kind of innovation. Right? And this innovation may be better or worse, the difference between having some IP and virtually no IP may not be in how much innovation you get. It may be in the kind of innovation you get. It's not an economist's conversation about how much. It's a person's conversation about what we like. I think that's the lesson from comedy. So I could talk more about things in the book. I could talk about football, for example. There's lots of innovation in football. Um, none of it protected by copyright or patent. Um, why do football coaches innovate so much? Because it really pays off now. And they don't care so much about the long run. So first mover advantage helps a lot in football. I can talk about open source software. I can talk about magicians. Um, I can talk about databases where here in the United States, we have a relatively more lenient regime for copying in databases than the Europeans do uh, with no seeming penalty 
in our innovation in the area. Um, there are lots and lots of examples of what I'll call intellectual production without intellectual property, where you see imitation coexisting much more comfortably with innovation than you would have anticipated, and sometimes even sparking innovation. But I'll stop there in the hope that you'll have some questions. And thank you again. It's been a great pleasure to come here and to honor you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so hi, folks. I'm Mike Carroll. I'm the director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property, and I will play traffic cop uh, as you direct your questions uh, to Chris. We have microphones here and here. This We are being webcast, and if you could identify yourself and then pitch your question at Chris, we'll do about uh, 10 to 15 minutes of, of this, and then for about 10 minutes, Chris has been, uh, is willing to sell you his book uh, at half price. <laughs> Um, at half price, so we have a, a, a couple of copies, um, and I believe he's got a pen, so a signature might also be part of the bargain. Uh, you can negotiate with him. Uh, but let's do some questions. So, Jomo. Oh, is that mic on? Uh-oh. We're out of batteries. Okay. Okay. Uh, shout loud. Okay. Uh, no, I, uh, I'm John So there'd be no Sergeant Pepper, for example. It's a great point. So let me let me try to respond first by backing up a second and explaining um, what my motivation was for writing the book, because it actually gets directly to that question. So. Um, the motivation was a very simple and practical one, which is um, if you look out in the world, um, the way technology is developing, it tends to make copying easier and stopping copying harder. Um, nothing that I've seen suggests that those trends are about to reverse. So the, the question that animates the book is assume that that's right. Um, what, what can we expect for the future of creativity? Um, the observation was, well, there are a bunch of industries, actually some pretty important creative industries that often for accidental reasons or historical reasons, have lived in the world of easy and even legal copying for a long time. And they've found ways to adapt. So let's study the ways that they adapt and then see if we can offer some um, uh, help to industries that are essentially being forced to adapt by piracy, by copying that's harder and harder to restrain. Okay, so this question that you raise about product versus performance, so people say this to me in the context of the music industry all the time. So it's true that the live performance part of the music industry is doing well relative to the recorded music part of the music industry. And in the book, we have an epilogue on this where we basically say, so music's not dying. There's, there's more and better music now, popular music available now, than there ever has been. Um, what's happening is the recording industry is changing, right? The recording industry is a less effective intermediary. Um, the cost of making recordings has gone down. The cost of distributing recordings has gone down. And so the industry is reshaping. It's reshaping in part because of piracy and in part because of technology even without piracy. The industry is reshaping. 
What do we think about that in terms of what kind of cultural product we get? Probably, you know, you can predict, I'm not sure of this, but music is going to become um, more focused on live performance, right? And there are some people who think that's great, and there are some people who bemoan that, right? We're going to get less Sgt. Pepper, but we're going to get more wonderful Bruce Springsteen shows or something like it. There's always a trade-off, and every industry structure at any period of time in the history of art, in every art, is going to deliver to you some things better than it delivers other things to you. So we can have a cultural conversation about what we want, and we can legitimate, I think, IP interventions based on really wanting something that we don't think we're going to get if we just leave well enough alone. But I guess the modest suggestion I would make to you is that is a very different conversation than the one we typically have, which is that creativity is going to wither and die if we don't have enforceable, strong IP. Creativity is likely going to change more than it's going to wither and die. And I, I like you, so I was just, I think the last great album that was really committed to ones and zeros was in 1997. That's Radiohead's <laughs> OK Computer. And, um, you know, and I'm getting old, and so maybe that's just because I'm getting old. But I really think that was a, a landmark, and I haven't seen one since that rises to that level of wonderfulness. And, you know, to me, that's kind of important. But when I talk to my students and I say, you know, don't you want another OK Computer? They don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> right? What they want is the next song from Passion Pit. And they don't even expect the songs from Passion Pit to kind of run together into an album. They just want the songs. Right? So your framework um, changes as the industry's product changes. All right. All right. What? No, no. You, you, uh, you can just be loud. That's it. of the declining press here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as an analyst, I have to be fair and balanced, right? As much as, as my news. So I have to ask you a question. You know, you laid out these examples of where copyright doesn't seem to be necessary, that right. doesn't help. On the other end of the spectrum, can you point to two or three places where clearly innovation just would not happen without something that looks like our product? Yeah. Like the R regime. Copyright people will tell you that if it had a historical experiment, the French Revolution abolished copyright. The result was a lot of novels and lots of typos. <laughs> that was their examples. And the places where we really did say, yeah, this, this policy is the right policy. So I've always been intrigued by the French Revolution example because what it seemed to me really salient about the French Revolution was not simply that it abolished copyright, but it abolished a lot of writers. And it did so relatively suddenly. So I think there was a production problem that related to that. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, typos, um, as publishing companies hollow out, um, I spent a lot of time correcting my own typos. And I, my publisher is a pretty famous one. And yet, they're not in a position to do that, right? The industry is changing. So give, I'll give you examples of um, uh, industries where I think IP is absolutely essential. Because, again, the message of this book is not that IP is never essential. IP is often either essential or at least extremely useful. The message of this book is um, there are limits. And also, these limits change over time. So technology changes these limits. It, it, it I think, over time makes more things possible um, with less investment in property rules. So let me give you examples of things that I think are absolutely IP dependent at the moment. So pharmaceuticals, absolutely IP dependent. It's the canonical industry where you have to motivate huge amounts of investment over long periods of time, not just to come up with a compound, but actually to get through the gauntlet of FDA approval. And, you know, and then you introduce it into a market that for most pharmaceuticals is relatively uncertain. It's just a high-risk, high-investment industry. Um, Appropriability is absolutely key to, to that industry. Now, can I imagine a future in which we automate drug discovery like we've automated, um, you know, the sequencing of the genome, right? So the first genome, it cost billions of dollars to sequence it. We're getting to the point where there's going to be a $1,000 genome, right? Technology can do amazing things in lowering the cost of 
these even very complicated um, things that we want. So I, I can't, it's not that I can't imagine a world in which pharma becomes a much less IP dependent industry. It's just that we're not living in that world. I mean, I'd love to, but we don't. So being realistic, I think patent is necessary. Um, in the creative, uh, the kind of copyright side of things, so I have a, I guess I have mixed feelings about the movie industry in the following sense. So on the one hand, um, the movie industry looks a little bit like pharma in that you have to motivate a lot of investment and it's very risky. On the other hand, my God, I spent a lot of time living in Hollywood and I can see the rents. The rents are driving around Rodeo Boulevard. The rents are shopping. The, the rents are sitting at the bar at the Ivy drinking $20 cocktails. Okay, so. Uh, if there were no IP or less IP in the movie industry, probably we'd get a less innovative movie industry, but Tom Cruise probably also wouldn't be commanding 15 million bucks a picture. Right? A lot of the rents would be beaten out of the movie industry. So it's kind of a mixed picture. Or you might um, have 500 Blair Witch Project. <laughs> You might, you might, and again, this is a cultural conversation you can have about what you prefer. Now, you know, my taste in movies um, tends to run to the expensive, so I went and saw Cloud Atlas the other night and loved it. So I'm not, you know, I'm not your indie guy who necessarily loves cheapo movies. But that said, you know, I know that tastes vary, and the degree to which you think IP is absolutely essential in the movie industry depends in part on your tastes. All right, two more, Bob. Um, hi. Um, I, I, first of all, I've, I enjoyed the presentation. I've learned a lot from your work. I'm going to be one of the purchasers of the 50% off uh, version of the knockoff economy. Um, and, and I think my question has to do with another part of the, the cultural conversation, um, which is that at its best, uh, part of what copyright does is it democratizes the funding of cultural product. And it seems to me that the two examples you started out with, fashion and food, depend on a very high degree of social stratification. There's the people who can afford to go to the original Jean-Georges von Gerichten restaurant. They spend a lot of money to do that. Part of what they're doing is simply uh, sort of branding their own status as the kind of people who can do that, right? And same thing in the fashion industry. And so I worry a little bit uh, about that world, about the world in which if the democratization of funding is gone, um, then we uh, depend upon and maybe end up reinforcing social stratification so that we have the innovation at the high end and then the trickle down to the chilies, you know, the, the year afterwards. Um, and so that's my, my contribution to the, to the cultural conversation. So can I, I really appreciate that, and can I just say that I, I'm aware of these problems, but I, I guess I have a completely different take, which is that the fashion industry is fascinatingly democratic. Okay, in the following way. So unlike the movie industry, which basically makes cultural product and then shows it to people, pushes it out there, the fashion industry is, is really a kind of roiling pit of appropriation, recontextualization. And it's not just that manufacturers are making clothes, designers making clothes. It's also the women and men who wear them. Right? There's, there's just an enormous amount of self-creation that goes on that the fashion industry aids and abets. I think the fashion industry is both highly elitist and, paradoxically, the most democratic, productive, creative industry and in the following way. So um, I spent about two years at the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, muddling my way through uh, about 20 years of price data for the fashion industry, and, and in particular for ladies' apparel, since they have very rich data about all the different subcategories of ladies' apparel. Um, with, with some research help, I, I took um, these price observations, of which there are millions, and I um, broke them into deciles, right? So the cheapest 10% all the way up to the most expensive 10% of clothes during that period. And what you see, if you adjust for inflation over that period, is deciles one through eight basically staying right where they are or declining a little bit over time, clothes either getting a little cheaper or staying about where they are. Decile nine and 10 going up very smartly. So about a 200% over the period, 250% inflation adjusted increase in deciles nine and 10. So at the same time that the fashion industry is pumping out clothes for the 1% and even the 0.1% and is getting more and more pricing power over that product, pirates are copying those things in cheaper versions, and those cheaper versions are becoming available to people further down the income ladder. They're available, but they don't seem to have any disciplining effect on the things that they copy at the top. 
Now, this isn't true of every instance, right? So it's, it's imaginable, at least to me, that the Forever 21 version of the Diane von Furstenberg wrap dress actually does lead some people to buy it instead of the Furstenberg wrap dress. But that's relatively rare. I don't think these thing, two things are, um, have the same patronage. So, you know, the fashion industry, at least, I think, is just culturally relevant in a way that it couldn't be if the only story really were social stratification. Um, food is, I think, possibly entering a period of similar cultural saliency. So there was an article in the Times just a few days ago um, that struck me as observing something true, which is that um, food has kind of replaced other forms of art as the topic of conversation for a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of food showmanship and a lot of food spectatorship as well as participation in food. Um, I don't think the food industry is at the level of the fashion industry in terms of you know, engaging the public imagination, but I think it's on its way possibly. Um, whereas the movie industry, you know, always seemed to me to be about a small number of people creating and a large number of people just spectating. Um, less democratic, even though um, it's democratically funded, public corporations that, you know, get money from you and me in terms of investment. So I'm not quite sure what to make of that. I understand the concern. I just think in terms of some of these important low IP industries, actually working out in ways that evidence social stratification but also produce a lot of democracy. Unless focus groups are co-authors. But uh, so speaking of food, I think a lot of us are hungry. So we're going to take one more question, and then we're going to invite those who are not buying Chris's book to join us for dinner. Dinner is it on this floor in the back corner there. Uh, well, <laughs> as you wish, uh, but please. Uh, Hi, I'm Stephen Jamar. I'm a professor at Howard Law School, and I'm the uh, international director of the Institute for Intellectual Property and Social Justice. Uh, I think I can do Sergeant Pepper's on my laptop now, so I think that we'll still see those being done. I think the technology has changed so much that that, that studio thing is, is changed in what we can and cannot do, and Stevie Wonder was doing it all by himself even before, right after Moog synthesizers came out. That's right. Um, what about auto-tune? I think that's a, an abomination that should be banned, so next time <laughs> we'd lose auto-tune the news, which would be a terrible loss. <laughs> really, really. Okay. Uh, so um, one thing that you didn't come, but I uh, talk about, uh, for time reasons, I'm sure, has to do with mashups and fan fiction online, uh, which, of course, there's a huge area of creativity where they're taking all sorts of things and putting them together you know, Stairway to Gilligan's Island is being one of my favorites that's now gone. Um, and then Numa Numa and Gundam Style. Uh, but um, a, a friend of mine did uh, Reddit and Hipmunk, and again, this is totally not dependent on copyright, uh, except for using other people's works right. that they then put on, but their property is totally open source, and Alexis O'Hanian says, you know, hey, take my thing and do it better if you want, because that's what we should be doing. And so I think that we have all these areas out there that uh, copyright and IP itself uh, aren't needed and indeed were maybe, maybe never needed and yes it does cause change but not as much change as perhaps just the technology and I think your final point about uh, the democratic role we now have internet crowdsourcing uh, where you can raise funds through the internet to do something good for uh, whether it's create you know funding a school in Africa or investing in somebody's new company or anything else. And so I think that we have all these new techniques. And I see that IP doesn't have certainly the same role to play. And I think that your book will certainly play a central part as I steal the ideas left and right for my copyright course next semester. <laughs> um, and one last question. Um, I see that Amazon is selling your book for $17. Is it, is it half off that? <laughs> Um, the Kindle is cheaper, uh, but no, it's, uh, I, th I think 17 bucks is, uh, is an affront to the publisher as far as the publisher is concerned, so I can't imagine half off of that. I wanted the book to be uh, cheaper, obviously, because think about my interest, right? So what motivates me to write? Um, what motivates me to write is I, I really want to get my ideas out there, in part because, you know, I'm an academic. I have a day job. Um, if I was doing this and I didn't have a day job, I might be more concerned about the returns, you know, directly from my book. But there are a lot of people like me, right? So you point to mashups and you, you point to um, things like the, the many videos um, honoring, I think, the Gangnam Style video. 
Um, these are people who engage in a whole bunch of creative effort. Um, you know, you might think that this is trivial, but these are people creating, and sometimes they create wonderful things. So let me give you an example uh, that I think is really great. So there's a company in Natick, Massachusetts called MathWorks, and they design um, software for engineers, and they, they have a a really great thing that they do. They have these uh, programming contests where they have complicated problems. Um, so for example, um, the traveling salesman problem. How do you um, get a salesman uh, to seven cities, basically? You have a certain amount of paths. You can travel. You can't travel them twice. What's the most efficient way to get to those seven cities? It's a complicated algorithmic problem. Um, so they put it up on the web, and they have programmers um, uh, working on these problems. They write code to describe an algorithm to solve this problem, and the code gets essentially graded for uh, accuracy and speed. Um, and what happens in this contest is you have people motivating, you know, hundreds of hours of labor to crack this problem the best they can. They compete one with another, and what's interesting is um, MathWorks allows all the contestants to see each other's code. So you get pioneers who come up with interesting new approaches to designing algorithms, and then you get tweakers who take others' algorithms and tweak them, wring the flaws out of the algorithm, and there's a, a dance that happens, and if you look at the data, you can see this dance, and it's absolutely fascinating. So a pioneer comes along, and they have a foundational insight into the way this algorithm can work. But the insight is always valuable, but never complete. These are NP-hard math problems. They're, they're insoluble in the time allotted, right? So the tweaker comes along and takes a look at the code and says, you know, I can wring a couple of flaws out of this. The tweakers wring the flaws out of the pioneer's approach to the algorithm, but as the tweakers wring the flaws out, the ultimate limits of the pioneer's idea become apparent because the inefficiencies drop away and the core limitation is exposed. Other pioneers take a look at this and they say, you know, I, I think we need a different approach. We need to take a fundamentally different approach to some piece of this algorithm. And they introduce their pioneering innovation. And then the tweakers set at it. The tweakers, right, they're taking. But in this environment that MathWorks has set up, which I think is like the environment in open source software generally, which is now a gigantic industry, these tweakers have an incredibly valuable role to play. They, they optimize pioneering inventions, and then they expose their flaws. There's a cycle to this that isn't like the cycle in the fashion industry, but at least is kind of metaphorically like it, right? There's a, there's a cycle of innovation tweaking with more innovation. I think this is unbelievably valuable. Um, and I think if you look, you'll see people in the world we live in now where doing this is relatively easy, tweaking other people's work, improving it, making it more relevant, extending its power, and that this is going to be, as the future goes on, a more and more important element of what we think of as creativity. Not just the pioneer, but the improver. Um, thank you. All right. And a great night.